morning, everyone. It's Tucker Goodrich. I am here with my co-host, Dr. Brian Curley. And uh, this morning, we are here to talk to a student about a paper that he recently published called Ability of High-Fat Diet to Induce Liver Pathology Correlates with the Level of Linoleic Acid and Vitamin E in the Diet. And uh, here we are with uh, Dalton Graham. Dalton, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Um, first, That's I would like honor. to say that <laughs> I would like to say that uh, Tucker was actually a huge inspiration uh, for a lot of the parts of this paper. So I originally proposed the idea in uh, in late 2020. Uh, I was first starting to work at a liver pathology lab, and cool. you know, just reading <laughs> yelling dash stop uh, gave me a lot of uh, ideas to you know, I go into a liver lab, I'm like, well, there's only one thing I can do. So <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, so and you know, I, let's just get this right out of the way. When I went through all of your citations, I was like, this dude, did he break into my computer? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, That's what great. can I say? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I was fortunate enough to, to be in a position where I could actually get in there and, and, see this stuff hands on, but I'll, I'll be the first to admit that you, you know, way more than me about most of this stuff. I'm well, I don't know. I don't, I don't get to play with this stuff in a lab and show that it actually works, but let's, so what's, uh, <laughs> you were at Tulane when you published this? Yeah. Yeah. So I did my, um, you're an engineer, right? A self-taught engineer. I mean, <laughs> they won't let me play with chemicals cause I'll blow shit up. I actually Not did. <laughs> in chemistry class in the 10th grade, we had an assignment to do something. And I did indeed cause a large explosion in my kitchen, which blew the light fixture off the roof. And thankfully I didn't burn the house down. You see, I, that's, that's the type of science that we need. That, that not well, pharma funded research. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I had never <laughs> drunk alcohol at that point, but I thought it would be a fun chemistry project to uh, build a still in the kitchen. And uh, it worked great until I got bored and walked away and then it fell over and the alcohol went all over the stove and hence the explosion. And luckily nobody was in the room at the time, but it became quite a bit of an issue at the school because my dad called them up and was like, you know, what have you got my son doing and blah, blah, blah. And I had to do the presentation explaining to everybody how dangerous it was and what happened and it was pretty funny. So yeah, that that that's my chemical engineering background. Yeah, you, you never would have got board approval for that, Tucker. Huh? You never would have got a board to approve that experiment. See? Well, Dr. yeah. Maybe Dalton, if I'd had you some, know had to <laughs> maybe if I'd had some proper supervision. Um anyway. So yeah. So you're yeah. a chemical engineer by background? Yeah, yeah. So the degree was uh was was at Tulane in, in New Orleans. Um it was chemical and biomolecular engineering. Uh you know, I, my favorite classes were my senior year when we got to take uh, applied biochemistry and it was basically all metabolism. And, uh, I'm still very good friends with, with my, uh, with my professor. He's one of my, one of my, uh, one of my guys, but yeah, we, we were, we would always like kind of tussle in class, like, you know, in, in a, in a fun way, but he would, he would say, you know, you know, oh, well, here's like the lipoproteins and here's LDL and this causes heart disease. And I'm like, I'm out. Let's, let's, let's back it up a little. Bit. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's awesome. I was one of those students who was, uh, who was very involved. So, so yeah. yeah, so I graduated, uh, in, in 2021. And then, um, I did a, a gap year of, of research, just working as a tech specialist in a liver pathology lab in the, in the medical school at Tulane. And, uh, yeah, looking back, it's very, and that's, and that's where this paper was written. Exactly. Yeah. So I, uh, I originally pitched the idea while I was still an undergrad, actually. Um, and looking back, it's, it's very interesting because, you know, I know a lot of people in the PhD program that I'm in now that still don't have first authors, even people that have graduated that still don't have first authors. So it was, it was actually an incredible blessing that I was able to come in and, you know, be able to study something that I was really interested in. And I thought that I could sort of provide a new uh, perspective because while they, they, you know, everyone has like the high fat diet model, which I'm sure we'll get into. But they were very interested in, you know, just like genes, receptors, different proteins. They were very interested in autophagy, which is obviously a big, you know, sort of topic. Uh, very fashionable. The, yeah, exactly. So they were they were very into studying the uh, the autophagy associated genes. 
but personally, I mean, I, I, you know, I read a lot of your work. Um, I was very into Chris Masterjohn as well. Right. And a lot of stuff that he would say about, uh, like the protein oxidation and, uh, you know, methionine and choline and how that plays a role in fatty liver disease. And I, I thought it was the, the perfect opportunity to be able to study it. So, well, I, so, le- I learned uh, a lot of what I know from him. Um, yeah. so <laughs> you're in good company there. Um, and now you're in Florida. Yeah. Yeah. I go to the university of Florida. I just finished my first year of the, of the PhD program here. Um, okay, so my lab now. Hey, thanks. Um, so yeah, my lab now is all about metabolism. Uh, we do a lot of, I don't know if you guys are familiar with NMR, Yep. And uh, and mass spec, but that's that's really our bread and butter right there. So max NMR be... is nuclear magnetic magnetic resonance imaging, which is what the NMR lipoprotein test depends on. The one that tells you what your LDL actually is, other than the calculated Friedewald <laughs> exactly <equation> yeah number. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, it's a lot of that. It is uh, the imaging as well. So MRI and then uh, mass spec is obviously a bunch of metabolomics, lipidomics, stuff like that. So. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'll be. So uh, what is your what is your PhD going to be in? Biochemistry. OK, great. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So and what are you looking exciting. to do with that when you get out? Um, I mean, any, you know, life life throws you curveballs and you may not wind up. I mean, look at Brian. He's a doctor. He never thought that was going to happen when he was your age. <laughs> yeah. And, I bet, uh, I bet Brian in medical school didn't think he was going to be a meme curator uh, as his primary job. But well, that you know. may be that may be more closer to his uh, younger days. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, what do you what would you like to go into if you had your pick? I um I don't know. And I mean, this is obviously, I assume, something that will bullet that we'll talk about, but, um, you know, I don't really have a, a, a burning desire to go work for a pharmaceutical company or a biotech company or anything like that. It just doesn't really align with my sort of views on health. Uh, you know, I think in general, we need to better understand and utilize the tools that we already have rather than constantly churning out new drugs so that we can patent them and right. continue to plug holes, uh, which, you know, is the business model at the end of the day. So it's not really something that I'm super interested in, but yeah, I mean, I think if I could do something, you know, maybe similar to what Chris does, Chris master John, like with, um, you know, just like consults, um, and stuff like that. I would also, you know, being in academia is not great, but I do love to talk about these things and I I love to be able to teach people when I can. So I wouldn't rule out, you know, staying in academia and maybe becoming a professor one day. So who knows, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's four years down the line. If everything goes according to plan, and four years ago I had no idea that I would be here, so right. I'm, pr- yeah. I'm pretty open keep, to, keep, to whatever. Keep it up. It, it's cool to see where life takes you. So keep it up. Good job. Yeah, man. Very Thanks. cool. Okay, so tell us about uh, tell us about your idea for this. What what was the? You're in a liver pathology lab. You, I mean, I will say, um, I didn't know who you were when you sent me this paper. Um, <laughs> And the first thing I did was look up your other publications and there aren't any. Nope. And then I was kind of like, wait a minute, who is this guy? Um, <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this. So you're in a liver pathology lab. Um, I presume you talked to them before you started them. You said you pitched this originally when you were still an undergrad. So how did, tell us about that and how it came about. That was, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was just kind of like very new and kind of dumb to the whole situation. Like, I didn't realize that as an undergrad, I was kind of expected to just, you know, uh, <laughs> kind of just assist the uh, the postdocs and the and the already grads in, in their work. But I was like, man, I, I have this idea. And then it was actually a little bit serendipitous because I had like a presentation for an engineering class. And it was like, all right, it's our senior year. So you could do whatever presentation you want. So my choice was, I was, I was like, I can kill two birds with one stone. And I made a presentation about the role of little excess linoleic acid in the pathology of liver diseases. Um, so then, yeah, I sat down and I pitched it over Zoom at the time, you know, it was late 2020, but I had pitched it uh, to the individuals in that lab. And uh, at first they didn't like really get it. And I still don't think that they really get what I was trying to do with this paper. I mean, I, I wrote it out as clear as I could, and I explained it as clear as I could. And, um, but, you know, it was just different sort of backgrounds. You know, they were very, you know, focused on on genes and proteins. They did a lot of knockout animals and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, I remember when I first finished, like, sort of laying out all the mechanisms and, like, why this is needed and sort of why I think what 
ended up happening would happen. Um, and then, you know, at, typically at the end of a presentation, you have a bunch of questions and there was just like silence. I feel like they didn't, <laughs> they'd never been presented with this idea that like this thing that you hear about all the time, lipid peroxidation or oxidative stress ends up manifesting itself mainly due to this dietary factor that no one even seems to realize because it's so ubiquitous that it doesn't actually get studied. Um, right. So yeah, it was, it was a little difficult to actually be able to sort of convey like what the difference was going to be. And they're like, this is a high fat diet. Like we already know what the high fat diet's bad. And I'm like, but I'm trying to explain why it's bad and why it's not just the high fatness of it. It's a specific component of that diet. Right. Um, and well, this is, this is the thing that drives me and, you know, Peter Dobromilski of hyperlipid and lots, you know, Brian and I have talked about this. You read high fat diet and it never, there's an amazing lack of curiosity about what in the high fat diet is actually driving this. Um, so what, what, yeah. what's your elevator pitch summary of this? Of the, of the, the high fat diet? Yeah, of the idea um, for the paper. Um, well, I think, I think what I needed was I saw that there was the, the literature about alcohol, liver disease and linoleic acid, yep. but I'd never seen it demonstrated where, you know, you're familiar obviously with the Alpine papers out of the NIH where they they varied, uh, they went from 8% linoleic acid to 1%. Right. Uh, and they showed obesity, um, in those animals, but they didn't look at liver. And then right. in the other papers that I was reading, they did the opposite, whereas that they were looking at the liver, uh, but it, with alcohol. And it, it had never just been an Alvheim styled sort of uh, difference in the linoleic acid level. And then also looking at liver pathology. And they, this lab had the tools to study, you know, the fibrosis and, and, and that sort of pathology. Um, and the closest I could get was like, you know, coconut oil versus safflower oil, but that still wasn't actually targeting the fatty acid itself. So I felt like that was really the driving force. And then, you know, talking about oxidative stress and lipid peroxidation and inflammation, everyone's kind of in the research world is a little bit familiar with those terms. So it was kind of easy to plug it in, but that was, I think that was probably why I wanted to do it because I'd never seen a paper that was just 1% linoleic acid, 8% linoleic acid, look at the liver. Um, it was always, there was always some barrier there. So that's kind of, that was kind of my inspiration. And then the vitamin E was added in more or less to, you know, elucidate a mechanism. Um, right. Well, right. And so, so if I can just back out a little bit for, for the audience, the Alpine paper he's referring to is one that was done. As a matter of fact, originally, I don't know if you're aware of this, Anita Alpine was also a student when she, I think it was her doctoral thesis or maybe her master's thesis. She did a paper on linoleic acid inducing obesity through the endocannabinoid pathway. And that idea was picked up by the National Institutes of Health here in the United States. And they turned that into a study which they published that showed that if you varied the uh, variables of interest were linoleic acid and saturated acid. So they swapped the two out and showed that a decline in saturated fat and an increase in linoleic acid from one to 8% of the energy in the diet, as you mentioned, causes obesity. And then they went into the mechanism being the endocannabinoid uh, pathway that's induced by excess linoleic acid in the body. And that was, I think, the first time that anybody had really drilled down and looked at what part of the high fat diet is driving this process. At least there may have been some older papers, but that's the one that really kind of put the idea on the map since it was, you know, coming out of the NIH and some fairly well-known researchers there. Um, and that, but as you said, they were just looking at one, that one little aspect and they had some, some people find very upsetting pictures of these dissected rodents showing how Which I presented in my engineering classes and that was not well received. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why people get so freaked out by that, but whatever. Um, but um, they yeah, were desensitized at this point, but <laughs> yeah, but they were, you know, very fat and I one presumes they also would have fatty livers because fatty liver is essentially the manifestation in the liver of obesity. So anyway, so that's that's the background behind this paper and I've seen a couple of other 
maybe one or two papers replicating that result in an obesity context. But yeah, nobody took it to the liver. Now we have, you mentioned in your paper, um, however, direct evidence suggesting the role of linoleic acid in the development of fatty liver diseases was lacking. That's not entirely true because we do have this total parenteral nutrition line of research going back to the 1960s where people who can't be fed orally are fed intravenously and for a long time what they were doing was injecting soybean oil and you know some other things into people's arms to feed them and one of the reliable outcomes of that was that they would get what's known as parenteral nutrition fatty liver disease which some argue is the exact same thing as not, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'm of that opinion. But obviously, there's a difference between injecting something into your veins and eating it, right? So you're looking at how are we going to drive this 30 40%, I think, of Americans have fatty liver disease at this point. Um, you know, it's a new disease. It only started first paper describing it was published in the 1980s. There was some little old grandma they found and they said, you know, grandma, you've got fatty liver. You're going to have to start drinking so much. And she was like, I'm a teetotaler. I've never had a drink in my whole life. And all of a sudden they discovered another disease that had apparently never existed. So take us through that line of research and, or and, that and line of thought in your, uh, in your research here. Well, and, and children now too. I children. Mean, oh yeah. God. <clears throat> A Crazy. sizable percent even of non-obese children. I think I read maybe up to words of 8%. It's crazy. So this, yeah. is, a pub this is a public health crisis. Right. Yeah. And this leaves, yeah. it's, you know, now that they can cure hepatitis C, uh, that was the leading cause for liver transplants in the United States. And it is now being overtaken by fatty liver disease. So this will kill your liver and kill you and cause liver cancer if it's not brought under control. That, that is how important this investigation, these types of papers, this type, you know, th these topics are to everyone listening. That's how important this stuff is, because we're talking about, uh, you know, diseases that are killing people and are skyrocketing in prevalence. Yeah, absolutely. And to go along with that, I don't even know if this made it into the end manuscript, but I did include a little section in the discussion that was about like future directions. So obviously, you know, there's only four animals per group. So that's like an area to expand on. But another thing that I think I brought up was like transgenerational effects because uh, excess polyunsaturated fats have been shown to accumulate to a certain degree in uh, in actual in breast milk. And that obviously right. uh, ends up affecting the, the health of the child. So I, I was like, that would be a very interesting line of studies that, um, you know, obviously take a while, but that would be very important to look at because I also know that a lot of the formulas out there have uh, a, a ton of linoleic acid in them as well. But right, to, and to I've interviewed uh, Tom, Brian and I interviewed uh, Tom Brenna, who's a leading researcher in that area. And I interviewed um, Bruce German, who actually used to work as a research scientist at Nestle developing baby formulas. And that particular topic is big research interest to both of those two gentlemen. So, yeah. You know, it's it's Brenna actually has done some work that's gotten the World Health Organization to change their feeding recommendations based on the demonstrated negative effects of excess linoleic acid in the diet in human children. So, yeah, yeah. that's that's a hugely important research area. Yeah. So to, to Brian's point, I mean, not only is it increasing in prevalence, but it's actually being compounded because uh, these fats accumulate in the body and it's not it's not as simple as that's the thing is that you know if you go out to eat and you're like oh i, I don't want that because it has seed oils or whatever you know the common response is oh it's just like one time but it's not one time if it stays in your body for a period of time and there's there's a number of of you know toxins like that that accumulate over the time and in, in out of yeah, like pcbs and ddt yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah ddt was banned in i think the late or the early 70s and we're right. still finding it in the environment and in people so you know right. um that's just you know that kind of just illustrates the point but but uh tucker to your to your point and correct me if i'm wrong on this but that 1980 mayo clinic finding was that uh, fatty liver or is that because I think the um the title was steatohepatitis so that was actually one of the 
things that kind of drove me to look at this was I know that there may be studies with saturated fat, uh, saturated fat overfeeding that showed like liver fat accumulation, but that condition in and of itself doesn't seem to be associated with that much morbidity and mortality. But when right. you cross over to the, the inflammatory, uh, non-alcoholic stab hepatitis, and then that turns to fibrosis and eventually cancer, if it gets that bad, that right. is where, you know, you're doing some serious systemic metabolic damage. So, um, that was one of the other motivations was that, you know, I didn't want to just look at the accumulation of the lipids in the liver, but I also wanted to see, does that, you know, trigger this inflammation? Does that trigger the, uh, the fibrosis or the scar tissue in the liver? And, and it appeared as though it did, um, some of the data and some of the histology in our study did show that. Cool. So fibrosis just for the progression is fatty liver which as Dalton mentions, can be pretty innocuous if it doesn't pr progress past that point, although it's often in practice associated with insulin resistance and obesity. But then you start getting NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is an inflammatory condition or associated with inflammation. And then you start getting fibrosis, which is, you know, a, Essentially, it's a breakdown of the structure of the extracellular membrane in the liver and a conversion into this fibrotic phenotype, which happens in heart disease with atrial fibrillation and some other conditions. And then ultimately, that can progress to uh, liver cancer. And obviously, since you can't live without a liver, <laughs> that's a very big problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's so you're you're looking at how are we going? Because there are. I've seen studies in parenteral nutrition where they show that just overfeeding with any fat will cause fat to accumulate in the liver. And that's just basically, you know, I mean, if you eat too much fat, your body has a way to not absorb it. Whereas if you're injecting it into somebody's veins, you know, I, it's got to go somewhere. And one of the places that it goes is into the liver. So yeah, there's definitely, that's a great point. There's a non- there's another pathway that can lead not necessarily to the same negative outcome. So you're focusing on the negative one. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, again, it's not that like fatty liver is a good thing or anything like that, but it just seemed to be the case that, you know, something else that I read about was that you can induce acute fatty liver in animals just by fasting them. And I think that's because um, you can get like a, basically a crap ton of free fatty acids flowing out of the fat tissue all at once. And then the liver deals with that, uh, with that burden sort of, um, all at once. And then that can cause what appears to be in histology, like fatty liver disease, but it is known to be like this acute thing. So that again, that's just kind of demonstrating that, yeah, you don't want to have a fatty liver, but if it's not driving inflammation and, and ultimately fibrosis, um, right. it's, it's likely not as big of a problem. So in that case, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, that's what the fat's there for is when you don't eat, it's stored fuel. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the, your fat in the blood goes up, the liver starts storing fat, and then the liver can package it into VLDL and send it out to all the cells. So that's a normal, a normal process. And I mean, that's a great point, because most of these things that we're looking at are normal processes that are going awry for some reason. Yep, absolutely. So now what the... So you wrote this idea up and what your what the professor in the lab think of it? Um, well, first I think he was kind of taken back to the fact that an undergrad wanted to pitch a, a project and, and do it all by himself without having really any previous <laughs> bio lab experience. But other than that, um he was he was supportive, you know. Um I think I think he sort of realized that I was very into that and that you know, it could bring sort of a different element into the lab um, because they had done, uh, they had done sort of dietary modifications, but like one thing that's very popular is the uh, methionine choline deficient diet, which basically right. if you don't supply methionine, you can't produce choline. You don't, if you don't have choline, you can't export fats from the liver properly. So that's one thing that they, that they did a lot. Um, which then, causes fatty liver, but that's almost a special case because it's a nutritional deficiency that's driving it. Exactly. Yeah. But it is, you know, it is one of the, the animal models that they use. Um, right. and then 
you know, they did the, the alcohol stuff as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty well received. I didn't think they were going to do it at first. And then, you know, I came in the lab one day and there's like pounds and pounds of, of mouse food just out in the open. They're like, here it is. Go ahead. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. Um, so yeah, I, it definitely, I did a lot. It was a lot on my own, you know, kind of just figuring out a lot of these things. And some of my favorite parts of doing that project were seeing how the animals sort of behaved. Cause it's something that, you know, unless you're doing like a behavioral sort of experiment, you never see the fact that, oh, wow, these animals that are eating the higher linoleic acid, they appear like physically slower. Like normally when you pick up a mouse, it like scrams all over the place. It's full of energy and it freaks out. Obviously you're picking it up. But I noticed that with the higher linoleic acid fed animals, they didn't really have that response. I would pick them up and they were like, all right, go ahead and like take me. <laughs> just lethargic. Like, yeah, they seem to be just like a lower metabolism, like lower energy animal. And, you know, they obviously weren't like that before I started feeding them. So a lot of that stuff was, was very, uh, was very interesting to see. Did you see the uh, Speakman paper that just came out? Um, which one? Uh, looking at the decline in human metabolism over the last few decades. And yeah, yeah I, he's so he's seeing that same thing that's happening in humans and he's attributing it to a component of the obesity epidemic because what he's seeing is that people's basic metabolic rate is has gone down and that people are in fact trying to exercise more to compensate for it, but it's not enough. Um, so yeah, you were seeing that up close and personal with these poor little mice. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it was definitely apparent. Um, and I did, I did see Wait, that paper. Um, you weren't, I, you weren't measuring metabolism. You were just noting behavioral changes. Yeah, no, we, um, unfortunately, you know, in research, there's a lot of sort of like cross lab and cross departmental, uh, you know, collaboration, if you will, you know, just if you want to sort of go out of your labs, normal, you know, look at this protein, they have these antibodies in the store, they have these like PCR uh, primers in store, like just the stuff that's in your lab. But if you right. want to go outside of that, you have to communicate with the other labs, obviously. Um, and I did, I did actually go to like one or two training sessions uh, with the metabolic cages, which is basically like you put the animals in, and then you measure their respiratory exchanges of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then you can get a proxy of, of the metabolic rate from there. Um, but unfortunately, that was also run by students who I don't think had uh, enough experience to be able to teach it effectively. So I, uh, um, I didn't, I didn't really get to learn that, unfortunately. But yeah, just just based on the behavioral, and that's you know, that's obviously not something you could publish, but it's it's cool to talk about. It's cool to talk about. You know, I remember you know, it was in New Orleans and it's very vulnerable to hurricanes. And when there's hurricanes, it's bad. Like the whole city kind of shuts down. Everyone freaks out. It's, it's a very stressful situation for everyone involved. And I remember we actually had a group of, we had, you know, in the, in the final manuscript, there was only the, the male animals, but we, we originally had female animals uh, as well. Um, but after that hurricane, I think the we we had been feeding them for four or eight weeks, and then there was a there was a huge hurricane. I think in September of twenty one in New Orleans, and the power went out, and you know we had to rearrange animal cages, and you know we were kind of in scramble mode to keep everything going. Uh, so in my mind, it obviously put like a lot of stress on these animals, and I remember that the females that were fed the high linoleic acid without the vitamin E, they actually lost a lot of their fur, and we really? couldn't. Yeah, we couldn't continue feeding them. Um, we couldn't continue the experiment with them because the trends that we were seeing just completely sort of abolished after that hurricane. And it seemed like they actually went in the opposite way. Like they were looking, they were looking like pretty raggedy, like they were looking pretty bad. And it was only in that one cage that was that was the females getting that that diet. Um, but again, that's not something that you can really publish. But I've I've never forgot that because I always look back and I'm like, you know, can I say for sure that it was the diet that did that? I mean, in a scientific sense, no, but I definitely think that, you know, I definitely right. think that added stress combined with the, with the uh, polyunsaturated, the high polyunsaturated fat diet, 
yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all if. So yeah, yeah, it suggests an impaired stress response as a result of the diet you're feeding them that the other mice were able to shake it off and they lost all their hair. That's pretty dramatic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's like, you know, we had to, it's not something you could publish, but something that I realized and something that I, you know, can share from time to time. Um, well, that's uh, great. Cause I mean, that's, that's the kind of thing that I love hearing about. Cause as you said, you can't, can't, it doesn't make it into the paper, but it's certainly one of those things that makes you think and should spur further research. I don't know how you, you know, I guess you'd have to come up with some non-hurricane mechanism to <laughs> recap. <So>, yeah. <laughs> this, this sounds like a part of research that most people aren't really exposed to or hear about or talk about, which is the, the freedom that you have to side experiment, as long as it doesn't interfere with the experiments that you're doing and some observations you can make. Because it sounds like you're able to use those opportunities to maybe form hypotheses, you know, like maybe we can look into this and, um, and that's pretty cool. It's something I, I haven't really thought about having not really been involved in those, those type of experiments before. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's pretty cool that you all have that ability to, like you said, look at other cages, look at other teams, talk to other folks. And, you know, so that, that's pretty neat. Something I probably would like to explore more and talk to you about more in the future about, you know, and that actually, that would be a great thing to talk about here after we, you know, after you go through the meat and potatoes of the research, you know, what, what, what hypotheses would you may want to, you know, develop and, and posit to, to explore in the future? Yeah, yeah and definitely. Um, I mean, like, I'll be honest, I mean, a lot of the, the coolest stuff that I have learned in research, you know, doesn't end up in a final manuscript, because, you know, actually getting published out there by a, a decent journal that's going to be seen by anybody really you know it, a lot of the you know <laughs> bad bad analogy bad pun but a lot of the fat gets trimmed off in the end you know you have right. to you have to exclude or you know say things that you normally wouldn't or at least like and there's a lot of like they're not studies but they're just like hey like let's run this and let's let's see let's see if we see it um, you know, especially now I have access to, to mass spec. And if you guys aren't familiar with mass spec, it's like, if you run it properly, you can see hundreds of different metabolites. And obviously you're not going to publish all of them unless you're looking at like, you know, a whole, you're doing like a metabolomics paper. Um, but you know, it's cool to be able to say like, oh, wow, I can see serotonin. I can see cholesterol in this. And then you can go and quantify it and yeah, it might not make it into any end manuscript, but it's definitely it still helps you understand things better. And, you know, at the end of the day, like research is awesome, but I like, I liken this to like, like being into sports. I don't know if you guys are into sports, but yeah, it's like, if, um, it's like only reading research and then not taking into account anything else that happens is like, it's like, if you only read stats, like it, it's a very important source of information, but you know, at the end of the day, you still need to watch the games and you still need to be able to assimilate different pieces of information uh, right. because what actually gets published in research, you know, is pretty limited and it gets filtered through a wonderful process called peer review. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, which certainly has its <laughs> pros and cons. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you started one question I had, and I know you published the Diet details. God bless you for doing that because way too many of these studies don't. And um, oh, I, I was making sure of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, were you trying to replicate the Alpine diet? Or was yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. I actually, um, when I first pitched this in late 2020, I actually found uh, uh, Anita is her first name. Yeah. Anita. Yeah, Alpine, I, uh, yes. yeah. I reached out to her on LinkedIn. Um, I just messaged her. I was like, how do I get this diet? Because <laughs> I want to look at it in the liver. Um, and then she basically was like, look, I haven't done research with the endocannabinoids and linoleic acid in years, but here's the, here's the website. You go to this website and, and you can, you know, they archive all the diets, you know, if it's ever done in a study, then that manufacturer of the diets will keep it, you know, ah. in most cases they won't get used again, but it is something where I was able to go back and actually pull that exact diet. Um, and it was, um, the funny thing is that so now just, just to bring that point to the conclusion, so you were lowering saturated fat in the higher linoleic acid group. I was, 
I was lowering saturated fat. Um, Cause as I said, in Alfheim, the two variables they were adjusting was saturated fat went down and linoleic acid went up in the group that had the higher levels of obesity. Uh, yes. I think that, I think that the, uh, the biggest change was in the monounsaturated fat, if I remember correctly. Um, which is why I think we actually would have seen better results if we had, you know, done a more saturated diet, because you know, you look at some of these older papers where they're, uh, where they're saying like the, the title is like beef tallow treats, <laughs> treats fatty liver disease or whatever. And, you know, alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously beef tallow has a good chunk of, of monounsaturated fat, but it has a lot of those long chain saturated fats that that seem to be very protective for the liver so i think we would have seen better results um otherwise interesting um, but one interesting point is that that chow diet no one ever looks at the control diet and i think this is very interesting um but are the standard chow diet that whatever you're in if you're in uh, a university that does research there's whatever there's like the animal house where everyone's animal cages are um and then they just have like big buckets of of rodent chow which is what they what they all eat that they know it's like dog food it's like you just give it to them you don't even think like this just, it'll keep them alive right um but it in most cases you know it doesn't necessarily lead to any problems or else they wouldn't use it as that as the control diet um and these this diet it was actually incredibly hard to get information about it i ended up having to call the company and i was emailing back and forth with the manufacturers of the chow diet for quite a while and that final number of of uh you know everything in that diet it's within a confidence interval it wasn't like the diets that i ordered the uh the one percent the eight percent linoleic acid and the eight percent with vitamin e those i knew exactly what was in them um but with the chow diet it was like yeah i mean we kind of just like throw these scraps together and like this is our estimate um so when i asked them you know like how much linoleic acid is in it and they were like I mean, we can give you an estimate, but we're, we're, our confidence is, is pretty, pretty limited on that. Um, they did know the amounts of the vitamins because that's fortified. So they did know that, right. but that chow diet is used by like the whole university. And in a lot of cases, they don't really even know <laughs> what it is. They just know that it's not high fat and that, you know, the animals seem to be fine on it. But I'm, as I'm discovering now that chow diet has i think it's about 12 or 13 percent fat and a good chunk of that is lard and soybean oil and right. it's like oh, aha well that that disproves your theory that the that the that the poopas are bad but now i'm finding out that in my uh in my current lab we have animals that were fed 24 28 32 weeks on it so much longer than my original experiment and i can see histological evidence of liver fat accumulation even in the control animals which is very interesting. And then I would ask- Which suggests you've got a, I mean, not your fault, but it suggests you're not, you don't really have a control group. I mean, I've had, there is a researcher whose name I can't remember right at the moment who has commented on exactly that, that, you know, different labs use different chow diets and the chow diets are not neutral and they're not all the same and they're not accounted for exactly as you just described. But I mean, Peter Dobromilski, um, who's a vet, found a paper where they took the chow diet and then they gave the mice additional healthy fats and they lived substantially longer right so the chow diet is not you know it's cheap it keeps them lo alive long enough to do the um experiments but it's not and it you know allows them to reproduce but it's not by any stretch of the imagination an optimal mouse diet or a wild mouse diet no no, definitely not. And um, yeah, it's 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 very interesting to see. Again, not something that necessarily gets published on. But I remember like a couple of weeks ago, we were in the MRI room. You know, we were putting we have this massive MRI and we're putting this this little animal on it. But even the control animals in that scenario, you know, when you cut them open, I was like, is that a high fat diet one? They're like, no, nah, man, this is a control. And I was like, dude, that thing is fat. It's I can I can see with my bare eyes without a microscope or anything. I can see that the liver has fat. And then he was like, yeah, man, even the control ones, you know, if you feed them long enough, they still will get fat. They'll still get like liver fat accumulation. The only way that you can really prevent that in the long run is if you use like what they call, I mean, this was just his take, uh, but if they use like an even lower fat diet, so like under 10%. 
Um, in that case, that then they seem to be protected for longer. But with the, just the the standard chow right. that's in the animal room, if you feed them long enough, they still get a semblance of of metabolic abnormalities there, which is which is very interesting and should make you know make us question exactly what we're comparing things to or, or what our benchmarks are in terms of like an optimal diet. So, right. Right. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, all right. So tell us about why vitamin E. Well, um, so you had, yeah. you had low linoleic acid, high linoleic acid, and then high linoleic acid and vitamin E added. Tell us about that. Why vitamin E? Yeah. So, uh, vitamin E, you know, it has a number of different roles in the body, but its primary role is to prevent against that lipid peroxidation uh, that is exclusive to the polyunsaturated fats. So they prevent that sort of non-enzymatic degradation of these fats that can, you know, that I hypothesized was a big driver behind these liver um, dysfunctions. Well, that's not really a hypothesis, it is. But I, I presume that that was going to be a major mechanism that we wanted to look at. So that was the reason why I included that group. And in fact, what's funny is that it wasn't actually like adding vitamin E. I actually just took vitamin E away from the other one, uh, the other two diets. So they, um, it, it was it was really about that ratio of the vitamin E to the polyunsaturated fat. And this is again something that Chris Masterjohn talked about in the, um, I think it was in the, uh, I want to say it was the Sydney diet heart study or maybe um or the LAVA study where like some of the groups that were fed the Two saturated human fat polyunsaturated fat feeding experiments geared towards cardiovascular disease yeah and uh and I think Ramsden did a reanalysis and I remember Chris showing that yeah like the saturated fat or the the not vegetable oil diet whatever it was may have done worse in some aspects but they didn't look at the ratio between vitamin E and polyunsaturated fat. And then when you did do that, even the lower polyunsaturated fat group in those studies still had a worse ratio of vitamin E to polyunsaturated fat. And he hypothesized that that could have been one of the reasons. And they were also like, they had more smokers. So I remember him saying in one of these videos, so not only did they not have vitamin E, but they were throwing cigarettes on top of that. So of course they were going right. to have like more cancers or whatever it was. Um, so I think that that was probably a main driver. I mean, you know, you guys know this better than anyone that, you know, the, uh, lipid peroxidation and the oxidative stress seems to be a major driver of all of these conditions, but especially in the liver. Um, so yeah, having that one group with the elevated ratio of vitamin E to polyunsaturated fat, that was really to see. Okay, so if the if the low linoleic acid diet and the high linoleic acid diet goes according to plan, let's try to figure out what exactly the mechanism is there. Um, so, and since vitamin E protects against to some extent against lipid peroxidation, if you add it in, and they don't get the negative effect that you're looking for, that suggests that that's the exact pathway that's causing your negative effect. Exactly, exactly, and since. Um, you know, since I originally came up with that idea, I've since found that vitamin E has a ton of other interesting effects. So that kind of ends up confounding it. But I, I think vitamin E actually can inhibit the uh, the COX and the LOX enzymes. So these are the enzymes that convert arachidonic acid into the inflammatory prostaglandins. Interesting. So I, uh, yeah, but that was just something that I, I figured out when I was writing the manuscript. Um, so, you know, in in all of these studies, they they like to frame it as though that it's very clean. Like we did this, we only did this one thing and then we only did this one thing and it completely went away. Therefore it has to be that one thing and that one thing only, but it's not, that's never the case. Drugs are nonspecific. Vitamins are nonspecific. Diets have all different types of effects. So, you know, it was nice that we were able to demonstrate some level of protection with the vitamin E, but to say that I'm like hundred percent confident that it was only because of the lipid peroxidation, that would just be lying to you guys. So, okay. That's no, that's a great point to make. And I mean, there have been a lot of human studies looking at vitamin E and cardiovascular disease that failed. It didn't show protection. And in fact, the humans in some cases had um, worse outcomes. And it's been uh, 
apparently there are some circumstances where vitamin E can act as a pro-oxidant. Um, and I guess that may be system dependent because you didn't see any evidence of that. Meaning we, it can enhance lipid peroxidation. I actually, I haven't seen that. So is that, was that like an intervention or was that just looking at like plasma levels? Intervention. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I mean, um... the obvious idea is, okay, so you're saying too much oxidation is the problem. Let's give them an antioxidant and vitamin E just, you know, for the audience, I know, you know, this vitamin E in plants is packaged with linoleic acid and it's protective. So the idea was, okay, well, if we package it up and feed it to people that way, right? Vitamin E is added to the, you know, it's in the bottle of uh, vegetable oil you get at the store because it protects it against oxidation while it's in storage. So, I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable idea, but when they've tried it in humans, humans with higher vitamin E have higher levels of heart disease. And as an intervention, they did worse. So, but again, yeah. they were looking yeah. at a different different disease, different organ, different pathways, not. And, um, but, and that's, you know, again, that's a, that's a great point to sort of illustrate that. Um, so one of the things about vitamin E is that, you know, it's not just one vitamin, there's a bunch of tocopherols, so it is possible. Right. And I'm familiar with the research that you're referring to. So I don't want to speak for it, but in a lot of these studies and mine included, we only included alpha tocopherol, but which gamma is, tocopherol, the, the human, the one that humans prefer. Yeah, I think, but I do think that there is some evidence uh, about the other isomers potentially, um, you know, again, my, uh, my experiment wasn't animals. Um, so maybe there would have been a different outcome had we given a, a different, you know, composition of vitamin E isomers, that's possible. Uh, and there's right. also, you know, there's also interactions with the fat soluble vitamins. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with the interactions between A, D and K. I think that there might be something going on there with vitamin E as well. But the point is that, you know, if you give someone a crap ton of vitamin D, they're not going to fare well. But if you give someone a crap ton of vitamin D and a lot of vitamin A and a lot of vitamin K, then they're likely going to be in a much more robust state because these vitamins tend to interact with each other uh, in, in a number of different ways uh, that seems to prevent against each other's toxicity. So that's, and in just, food, you know, and in, that's another variable. And in whole food, you get them packaged together often. You're not just getting one or the other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You're, you're, you're out in the sun and you're eating pasture raised eggs and, right. and maybe some cheese and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a harmonious sort of cycle. And, you know, again, to that point, um, vitamin E is present in high concentrations for the, like, I think it's for the sake of the plant to protect itself if it has that high concentration. So like, you know, if you're eating a lot of coconut oil or something, there's almost no vitamin E in that because the coconut doesn't need it. It's all saturated. What, what's it going to do with the vitamin E? It's almost um, no linoleic acid also, like a half a percent, some tiny amount. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like one of the, especially if you get like a hydrogenated, it's like one of the lowest polyunsaturated fat that you can get short right. of buying, I don't know, Brad's pure steric acid or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Um Interesting. So what did your, what the guys in the lab think when you started showing them, you know, the breakdown of, you know, it's not just a high fat diet guys. Look. Yeah, I think, um, well, if, I remember, I do remember that first lab meeting when I was showing, you know, we had whatever the first like third of those body weight charts and you could start to see the uh the chow faring the best and then the the two middle groups and then the high linoleic acid doing the worst and i think that was when they kind of started to open their eyes um you know and then from then on you know whenever we had like a lab lunch or something they would be like oh does this have linoleic acid i'd be like everything you eat has linoleic acid guys <laughs> um but uh but yeah so so that was um that that was definitely the case the thing is i don't think and maybe I, I think I probably just didn't do a good enough job communicating this to them, but I don't think that they understood like the importance of it in the real world because right. um, they were just like, oh, well, he's studying like this one fatty acid. But I don't think that they, I don't think that I might have emphasized enough that like, no, this fat is so present in all of our modern foods, but not in whole foods, um, that this is 
like a serious problem that's everyone pretty much everyone is eating that high linoleic acid diet and they don't even know it and right. i was trying i guess i didn't do a great job explaining that or they didn't do a good job listening or whatever, whatever happened but um i don't think that that part was you know maybe appreciated enough in the lab um but i i will say that once it started to show you know some promise with the with the body weights um, you know, and then I started to do the, the serum measurements. I started to do the histology and everything kept coming back with the same story. Um, then they wanted to, you know, add in the PCR with the, um, the genes, they wanted to add that in, then they wanted to add in the F480 staining. So it was nice in that, you know, I understand I was like the new guy. I had to, I had to prove that I kind of knew what I was talking about. And then, but once they saw that, it was nice that, that they were like, all right, let's do this now. Let's do this. Um, so they pitch, I, I they was, started pitching in and saying, well, you know, let's, let's explore this further. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and, you know, and then you, you go through peer review and you know, that's, that's a whole different topic, but they have, they say, oh, well, why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you do this? And I'm like, I feel like you guys don't understand that this is a time and money limited process. We don't have endless funds to right. keep throwing out one experiment. <laughs> we do have to get it. <laughs> well, out. You know. And I mean, one of my complaints about your paper was that you measured uh, mal malondialdehyde, and please correct my pronunciation. Um, if I think that's need, right, yeah. <laughs> if need be, and that's a chemical MDA that can be produced from either omega three or omega six fats, and the test that's often used for it, T bars, and we won't go into what that stands for, is kind of sloppy, and it's not specific for that chemical. Um, I would have preferred if you had tested for HNE, which is only made from omega-6 fats like linoleic acid and has been shown to drive fibrosis. So I think it would be a better, and also is involved in liver cancer and some of the mutations that drive liver cancer. And, you know, for my money, that would have been a much cleaner demonstration of the process that you're proposing is driving this pathology. But I guess... You didn't have money for that or what? something well, like well yeah i mean you see the thing is i was already introducing a number of different sort of ideas when i first pitched it and right. i knew at least that you know the t-bars assay or the, the malandialdehyde measurement would at least be something that they were a little bit more familiar with so i don't i, I just i also don't know that and it's, it's a I, standard lipid peroxidation test so exactly. they'd all know it exactly exactly right. so if i if i had gone on and said well, here's another Ramsden paper that shows all of these different lipid peroxides and I want to measure all of them. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how necessarily right. well that would have went over. But yeah, I mean, um, I would have I would have loved to to do H&E um, and to look at prostaglandins um, and, and, you know, lipoproteins and, and things of that nature. It would have been great. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it, it is a business in the sense that, you know, you have... You have a well, certain you amount don't have of money. infinite money or time or exactly staff. and yeah and i was willing to do whatever it, it took if i could learn it in time um but a, another limiting factor is that you know you do want it to get published and you know some of these very large scale nature or cell uh sort of uh sort of research papers they can take years to just finish the experiments right let alone to write the manuscript, get it edited, and then go through peer review, I formally get accepted and then actually publish, you know, that can be a multi-year process. Um, so, you know, for something like this, I was only there for a year and I wasn't, you know, I, I told them right. after we got the comments, I was like, look, if you guys want to spend money and you guys want to spend time doing the experiments, please do. All the tissues are there. You guys have it. Um, but I'm not going back to New Orleans to do it. And, right. uh, <laughs> right no that's that's, uh, that's fair that's yeah. totally fair well what are yeah, you what so. are you doing and what are you doing in florida now i'm doing research uh in in a new lab so i like i said before we do a lot of nmr and mri and, and mass spec stuff mm -hmm. but yeah i just i guess i can't get away from the liver even if i try because my my new pi I uh, said, Hey, we got this liver grant and we want you to look at these enzymes and we want to do uh, an imaging study with, uh, with a different diet. Um, what that diet is, is a bit 
I don't want to say it's a point of contention, but um, I we we're we're still discussing what the diet is going to be because they already did like a high fat diet study yeah, and they yeah. want to, they want to do something that would give you Different. yeah something a little bit more dramatic um mm -hmm. and it's it's funny because my my pi who's who's you know brilliant and he's all about metabolism and stuff but he said yeah if we add in fructose then they'll get nash and i was like what do you mean you fed them a high fat diet for 32 weeks they definitely already have nash <laughs> and then he right. was like oh no like Th that diet is just supposed to give them fatty liver but if we add in fructose then they'll get nash and i was like let me see those livers <laughs> and yeah. you know lo and behold uh you know nash is not a great diagnosis in the sense that we don't have any perfect really like it's not like diabetes where it's like all right above 140 and you're diabetic yeah. it's right it's yeah, more so of like you're looking at you're looking at the tissue and then the his and then the mm -hmm. um it's a spectrum the, uh, of it's and a spectrum that, of disease at that point and you're saying the, okay you've gone you know you're not blue anymore you're purple yeah speak, exactly speaking as a physician we'll see it on imaging like you get an ultrasound to check out your gallbladder or something and then it'll also say on there the radiologist will say fatty liver or you got a ct scan because you're worried about appendicitis and they go oh and you also have fatty liver um yeah. and your 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 um your alt and ast and your alkfos or something might not even reflect how bad it is. And we're starting to yeah. see it on a lot of people. I don't have the stats in front of me right now. I mentioned earlier, you know, what 8% in non-obese children, right? So we, we know where this is going. And I think one thing that's important, I don't think it's mentioned yet, is how this, this um, existence of the fatty liver is a it, it it makes you more susceptible to other forms of damage um not and 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 changes how you metabolize things like um for instance you could just uh you know the metabolism of of uh was a tylenol or or your susceptibility right. to the damage of alcohol and uh and the damage of fructose right now you know what came first if you've got a if you have a bonfire and throw wood on it, you're making a bonfire bigger, right? But you know you would be laughed out of the uh, out of the party if you said that wood causes the fire, right? Um, you know, no, never everyone would say that's silly. You have to start a fire. So, but that's there's so many different directions that you could you could take this with looking at um, uh, the consequences of these things and just just the fact that you and your colleague were having that discussion of fructose is great. You know, it'd be great to be able to like put data out there and 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 you know. Um, uh, strengthen your argument uh have to redefine your argument or completely change his, his mind you know depending on where it goes so it's, yeah it's I've, seen, I've seen a couple, i've seen a couple of papers looking at fatty liver in humans with fructose and they measure the damage by using hne and i'm like you guys know where that comes from right yeah it's not coming from the sugar <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah and um brian that's that's a great point i uh I actually, that is a direction that I want to take this next project. So this whole xenobiotic metabolism and glucuronidation, I don't know how familiar you guys are with these areas, but essentially, you know, we're talking about liver fat and liver damage and stuff. But one of your primary functions of your liver, any, anybody that drinks knows this is that, you know, it, it processes toxins. Um, right. Some of those toxins can be fats or lipid peroxides or, you Glucose. know, uh, different, yes, or different, um, you know, uh, uh, lipid, lipid toxins, but a lot of it is drugs and, you know, hormones. So if you have excess estrogen or excess cortisol, um, your liver can attach, uh, sulfate or it can attach glucuronic acid to that. And, um, and deactivate them. Sorry. And de deactivate excess hormones. Exactly. So that essentially it makes it more water soluble so you can, you know, excrete it out through your urine. Right. And, uh, that process does appear to become impaired in various like cirrhotic, uh, condition. So that is something that I, that I'm definitely interested in seeing is, you know, and, and um, the other point in that is that the unsaturated fats do show some inhibition, at least in vitro uh, of these uh, glucure, I can never pronounce this word. It's like glucuronal transferase enzymes that facilitate this process. So yeah, that's definitely, um definitely a, an area that, that I want to sort of explore more uh, going forward. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. That's 
this is uh i want to say congratulations on getting this paper published that's a huge task and Thank you. you know um selfishly having an awesome week because speakman's paper which i played a role in came out uh this week and or i found it this week tro collegian pointed it out to me i you know been talking to him about that for two years and then you sent me this one and i was like oh my goodness this is great what a great <laughs> proof of concept i mean speakman agrees with you by the way i sent him your paper and he thinks you need more than n equals four but i don't even think uh, you realize speakman or <laughs> john speakman yeah 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 and uh... i don't even think he realized that you were a student <laughs> <laughs> doing your first well, you can you can tell them i would i wish that too i mean <laughs> oh i totally will i absolutely yeah, will. i mean <laughs> i'll send him are you kidding i'll send him this interview um yeah no yeah, so huge fan, huge fan of his work though uh like like you said the the fact that he you know he's he's published in cell he's published in nature he's uh, obviously at the forefront of all this research yeah yeah you know, he, he has my ultimate respect i wish uh you know i'm very happy to see that he was able to make that connection saying, Hey, saturated fats actually might increase your metabolic rate. And that might be one of the, one of the big problems that we're seeing now. So it's just, it's just a nice change from the whole. It's amazing. The social media stuff can actually move the needle. Yeah. Yeah. Brian knows that better than anyone. So. <laughs> yep. Well, he's much better at it than I am. He's got a flair for it. I just, you know, blah, blah, blah. Text words, 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 as my life, wife likes to say. <laughs> you, have, you have to keep your finger on the pulse. You know, you gotta, you, you gotta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Dalton, uh, thank you for spending the time to explain your work here and to tell us some of the little interesting anecdotes that you found along the way. I mean, that's really enlightening. And, uh, that's great. Congratulations. Good luck down in Florida. Hopefully you won't see too many more hurricanes. Yeah, I think I think we're uh, we're inland enough here where that's that's not as much of a problem. But yeah, I mean, um, going forward, you know, I'm obviously very heavily invested in this stuff at this point, and I'm going to be sort of taking the reins of this liver project going forward. Um, so I'd be happy to continue to share the findings there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've kind of been kind of been barking at my PI for a while about linoleic acid and stuff. So I think, uh, I think, I think maybe we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to do some more, uh, some more looking into that in terms of, in terms of the future studies. So yeah, very, uh, very excited. I'll, I'll be sure to continue to, to share it, um, as much as I can. So, but thanks for having me. Uh, like I said, Tucker, uh, a lot of your blogging for the past God knows how many years, but I at <laughs> least started reading in, um, <laughs> at least started reading it. I want to say in 2018 or 19, uh, I think your posts about like cardiolipin really was like, wow, that is insane. Um, and that, uh, yeah, it was, it was a huge inspiration, uh, for me to really get into this and then ultimately, you know, have the opportunity to go in and, and actually see it in person. And, you know, it's reading the blogs is awesome, but actually looking at the package, seeing the linoleic acid and then giving it to an animal and then coming back a couple of weeks and then seeing them fat it there, it's, it hits wow. a little bit. <laughs> that's incredible that's oh, incredible yeah. well again congratulations on getting this out and keep up the good work hey thank you man thanks for having me on so much